Jesus, thank you so much for being alive. God, thank you that you are not a dead and buried God, but that you are alive, that you have um, anointed those of us that are following you with the Holy Spirit. God, I ask that you will be in this room, that you will be in the words that I speak, that your word will come alive, um, and that we will have understanding for it today. God, we invite you here, and we are honored that you even see it fit to be in the same room as us. God, we love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in a series called How the Good Go Bad, and all the stories that we're coming to you with are from the Bible, the inerrant and inspired word of God. So I just want to start with saying that when we're talking about characters from any of these stories, they're 100% historically accurately true. Like to even be put in this Bible, it wasn't just someone that was like, these are some neat stories. We should put them together and teach them to kids. It was like thousands of years across multiple continents with so many manuscripts, which means handwritten onto papers and verified by like so many important people that to become a part of the Bible, it had to go through a huge number of checklists to make sure that it was okay, that it was something that had been repeated and something that had been verified. And so we're reading today about two people called Ananias and Sapphira. If you want to follow along with me, we're going to be in Acts, which is in your New Testament. We're going to start in Acts 3. The first four books of the New Testament are the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are written by some homies that actually knew Jesus. And so all of them are firsthand accounts of walking with Jesus, hearing what he's doing. Um, And it's like reading their diary, but the Lord inspired it. So you get to hear what exactly happened from people who are actually there. And then the book of Acts is like the sequel. After Jesus has left, Acts is the story of the actions of the apostles and of the disciples and how walking on this earth with Jesus as his friends impacted their lives and how it changed ultimately our eternities. It's kind of unbelievable to think of, like these 12 homies that knew Jesus way far away in a completely other part of the world, like we know Jesus because of them, because they were obedient and they acted out of how they were impacted. So Anyway, we're going to be starting in Acts 3. So Ananias and Sapphira, they had the best everything, okay? So if Acts is immediately after Jesus has gone up to be with the Heavenly Father to prepare a place for us, then we are in the Church of Jerusalem here in Acts 3. And this group of people, this church, had the best church, They had the best pastors. They had the best community. Their pastors were Peter and John, two of Jesus' homie of homies, okay? Like they were in the garden when Jesus was so stressed about having to go to the cross and fulfill his purpose that he was sweating blood. They were there then. They were there when the transfiguration happened in the garden with Jesus, which means like two dead guys from heaven, like Elijah and Moses came down and, like, glory shone about. Like, they were there. They saw the craziest stuff happen. They saw people get healed. They healed people themselves. John was there when Jesus was crucified, when he was flogged and his skin was ripped off of him and the crown of thorn was shoved into his head. They witnessed it. They were there. And these are the pastors of this church, the church in Jerusalem. And so this is an incredible community. They are experiencing the most impressive healings, the most like enthusiastic and heartfelt messages ever from Peter and John who can't help but tell people about who Jesus is. And the craziest things are happening. Peter and John actually, out of all of their outspokenness, out of the healings that they're doing, they have made over eight thousand conversions. Eight thousand people have come to know who Jesus is. You see, in the city of Jerusalem at this time, there was this festival called Pentecost. And in in the Jewish community, only a couple times a year would you have to all go back to the same place. Like, they'd all scatter about, like, just say we're all over North County, and we're in Escondido, and we're 
Like, maybe we're even out in Rancho Bernardo and Bonzel and all these places, but every once in a while, they'd all have to gather back into one place. So say they all had to come to Vista. But they're not driving. They're walking. They're hauling all their junk, all their people with them. And they come for Pentecost, and they're coming to celebrate a Jewish festival, which means they don't know who Jesus is necessarily, but they definitely believe in God. But they get there, and Peter and John are sharing about who Jesus is and about the relationship that they had with him and the redemption that they have him because Jesus Christ died. And not only that, he came back to life. He brought himself back to life. And so they are hyped. These people are converted. They come to know who Jesus is, and they're like, oh, my goodness. And we're like, 8,000 people, that's rad. But let's really think about how many people 8,000 is. I hear these stories like, Jesus fed the 5,000 with, like, a loaf and two fishes. Okay. We hear, we hear fishes. It's fishes from here. Oh, uh, fire from the back. All right, so when you hear stuff like that, what I try to do is I try to imagine, like, what does 5,000 even look like? So let's imagine I come in here and I'm like, oh, we're so hungry. Oh, don't worry, I got this loaf of bread, no big deal. Okay, if the Lord, like, multiplied it and fed just this room, it'd be like, ooh, that was rad. Okay, what if I had one loaf of bread and then I'm like, how about we just run down to live and feed all of our parents and every adult ever, and then we go over to the warehouse, and then we go to the edge, and then we go to all of Coast Kids, and like, that wouldn't even cover 5,000. Like, what? That's insane. So when he says 8,000 people were converted and came to know who Jesus was, I'd like to, I'd like to figure out, like, what's that even look like? So check out this video real quick. It's from the Grammys. We can have music. There's no bad words, I don't think. Yeah, Bruno Mars. Okay, check this out. This is the Grammys. This is at Staples Center. All right, he's going up there on the stage. Look out at all those people. Look at all those people out there. Are you kidding me? That's so many people. All right, we can cut it right there. That, my friends, that's Staples Center for the Grammys. That holds 8,000 people. That is what 8,000 people look like. Holy boogers, that's so many people. I'm lucky if I impact like 30 in my lifetime, let alone 8,000. And so this is where Ananias and Sapphira go to church, is this place where people are hyped on the Holy Spirit. They are all about it. And it gets to a point, though, where Peter and John, they heal this guy, this lame guy who's been sick for 40 years. And they get arrested. Imagine doing such incredible and amazing things and seeing God work, and then you get arrested for it. All these people are like, oh, no. They start praying for boldness. We only pray for things like boldness if we're afraid. I don't pray for healing if I'm not sick. So if they're praying for boldness, it's because they're, they're kind of in fear of what might happen to them. Well, Peter and John are like, you can order us to be quiet, but we're not going to. Like, sorry about it, but this is, this is who God has called us to be. What God has called me to speak to the people is way more important than what you're telling me not to say. And so the church is praying for boldness. They're praying for this, this opportunity to speak Jesus' name and to tell people. And Peter and John are released from prison. There's an earthquake. The Holy Spirit comes on the church, and they are feeling like, oh, my goodness, Lord, there are things we need to do in your name. And one of those things was when all these people were converted and came to know who Jesus was, they thought, if they want to stay here and be part of our church, like, all their stuff that they need is at home. What if we start selling our stuff, and then we have money so that they can provide for themselves? Let's help out our brothers and sisters. That's what the Holy Spirit put on this church. So out of this prayer for being able to provide, this is what they're doing. So we're, we're going to pick up the story in Acts 4, the very, very end. <clears throat> but before we get there, we've talked about the good stuff of Ananias and Sapphira. We've talked about the incredible community and church and their pastors 
and how they show up and how they've seen the Spirit move. But I want you to understand something. Even if we come to church every weekend, even if we show up to small group every Tuesday, even if we're doing service projects, even if we're really nice to people at school, none of that matters if we don't know who Jesus is. None of that matters if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You see, what you need to understand is the most important part of anything in this life is a personal relationship with God. That's what changed Peter and John. That's what made them say, I'm not going to shut up. There are eternities that need to be changed. Theirs had been changed. And out of that, they responded with a boldness. And even when they were afraid, they prayed for God to fill them with more, more courage. A personal relationship is the most important part. And so we get into this story. Acts 4, verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, like we said, the church is like, Heck yeah, I want to do something to help. I'm praying for boldness. I'm praying for the Lord's provision. I'm going to be the hands and feet of God, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to sell my stuff. I'm going to put it at the apostles' feet. That's going to be used to help these people who are displaced but want to be a part of our church. That's what, that's what Barnabas here does. That's what him and the other people in the church are doing. They're acting out of what the Holy Spirit has put on their heart because they have a personal relationship with Jesus. But then we get to chapter 5. But, let your story never start with but. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. They had a great start. They had great community. They were seeing the people around them acting out of what the Holy Spirit had called them to do. But this is where their story goes bad. The bad about Ananias and Sapphira and what we can do differently, the first thing is they chose desire. They chose desire. And by desire, I mean sometimes we look at what other people have and we think, I want that. I think Ananias and Sapphira saw what Barnabas had and what everyone else had, and they saw this, like, amazing obedience, and they were able to give all of the proceeds of stuff that they had sold. And they, wa they wanted that praise. They wanted those accolades. They wanted to be like, yeah, that looks like they're, they're doing God's work. I want to do that. But I don't think they realized what it was prompted by. I don't think they understood a personal relationship with Jesus and having the Holy Spirit do it because they just wanted to be able to take their stuff, sell it, keep some of it, and then lie about giving all of it. Sometimes we get so wrapped up about what everyone else is doing that we forget about being accountable for ourselves. When I was in third grade, I was at this really cool assembly, and... I've learned about myself, I am a huge people pleaser, which means I'll do everything I can to look perfect. <laughs> so there, I just confessed it. Don't judge me. So I'm at this assembly, okay, and there's this person up there giving this whole presentation about like, I honestly don't even know because I wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden I see everyone raising their hands and I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna raise my hand. So that's what everybody else is doing. That seems like the right thing to do so that I look like I'm paying attention. All right, well, luck of the draw, they call on me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, look at me. I'm going to go do something. I don't even know what. I get up there, and they go, they pull this lid off of this giant container, and they pick up this gnarly boa constrictor. Here, you, you volunteered to hold this. Oh, so I got to hold this giant snake all over me. And they're like, don't worry. If you stay calm, it won't constrict. I'm like, okay, I'm super calm. Except there's a snake on me. That's all. 
See, I raised my hand in that moment because I was like, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why everyone was doing what they were doing, but I was like, I want what they're doing. I want, yeah, yeah. Pick me. Heck no. I wouldn't have raised my hand for that if I knew what I was signing up for. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we look around and we just go, I want what they have. I want their really happy family on Instagram. But you have no idea what it really looks like inside their home. I want to be as pretty as she is. I want to have her pretty hair. I want to be as good at football or basketball or baseball as he is. Or field hockey like she is. Or hockey like he, she is. I want what they have. And we let that desire consume us and we forget. We're in charge of ourselves. See, we can choose contentment. We can choose to see the things that the Lord has given us and say, thank you. It's weird to think sometimes. Like, I didn't, I didn't choose to be born in Southern California, in the United States, in the 21st century, with modern medicine and modern conveniences. And for the most part, food whenever I feel like it. And an incredible church. I didn't choose any of those. You did nothing to earn where you are right now. God picked it for you. God picked your life, your family. And he said, this is what I have for you. Have we ever stopped to thank him just for that part of it? Thanks for choosing me to live here. And then for some of us that are in crappy circumstances, how do you be content in that? The Bible tells us that God's goodness is made perfect in my weakness. That just means it gives me an opportunity to step out of the way and show people how I can still trust him in the middle of my crap. Some of us are dealing with family members with cancer or friends with cancer or our family doesn't have a lot of money right now, or our parents are going through a divorce. That sucks. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean we can't have a contentment that we have a God who cares more about our eternity and redeeming us from the grossness of this world than about the circumstance that we're in right now. What a testimony that can be. All right. Acts 5.3. Let's move on in the story. Ananias, Peter, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you've planned this thing in your heart? You've not lied to people, but to God. Shoot. So like, all of a sudden, Ananias is in league with the devil? That's incredible. That's a huge jump. His desire turned into deception. They chose deception. Instead of just going to them and saying, I sold all this, but you know what? I have this project I really want to work on at the house. I kept some of it back, and I'm going to just give you this leftover. Instead of doing that, it was like, because I want to look as awesome as they did, because I want to get as much praise as they did, even though I'm not acting out of the response of the Holy Spirit and the relationship that I have with Christ, I'm, I'm just going to like pretend like I gave it all. That half-truth is a lie. He lied to God. He lied to the Holy Spirit. See, what, what I used to do in high school, actually my freshman year, so I wasn't much older than many of you guys in here, I went to a private school. We had Bible classes, and like I said, I was a, I was a people pleaser. But I was going through this, I was going through this phase, no big deal. But I knew exactly how to how to sh trick the teachers into thinking that I was just the best. I'd go into my classes and I'd sit and I'd be so smiley and I'd raise my hand because that's like a problem I have is I'd raise my hand all the time, and I'd know all the right answers at least. I learned that by freshman year. I would 
know all the Jesus answers. So whenever like a question came up in Bible class or whenever I went to church, I would always know how to answer it correctly. That's part of why when I go to small groups, I'm like, I don't need your Jesus answers. I know how to do that. I know how to fake the crap out of life with Jesus answers. Shh. We can all hear you. So I was able to fake that with my teachers. I was able to get on to like student government and be like a shining example. But in the meantime, my peers knew exactly who I was. They knew the hypocrite that I was because I was deceiving them. It was a time when I was telling vulgar jokes, when I was using the foulest words that I possibly could and swearing as much as I could sneak into my conversations with my friends. I was crossing boundaries with guys. Everyone who was a friend of mine knew that. I had a reputation in my school with my friends, but did the teachers know it? Heck no, because I knew how to deceive. I was an expert. But that's the kind of stuff where you go and you tell your friends about Jesus and you're like, come to church with me. And they're like, do you know Jesus? That seems weird because you are a hypocrite and I don't want to hear about it from you. Are your actions building a way for you to, to share Jesus? Are you living in a way that people see you humbly accepting when you've made a mistake? Are you living a life of sincerity? We can choose sincerity. We can choose to be authentic. We can choose to be honest. And absolutely, that's going to come with having to own some stuff. We can choose sincerity. And then ultimately, let's find out what happened here. Acts 5, verse 5. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead. Dang, things escalated quickly. And a great fear came on all who heard. The young men got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. And about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the land for this price? Have you ever had your parents ask you a question and they're like setting you up because they know the answer, but they're giving you a chance to answer? This is that moment. Yes, she said, for that price. And then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. Whoa, that's a little crazy. All right, well, so here we go. Ananias and Sapphira chose death. They chose death. See, if I told you there was a live wire outside, like a down power line, and it's flopping everywhere and there's sparks, you wouldn't go outside and grab it and touch it. You'd be a moron because you would be electrocuted and die. So no one chooses that. No one's like, I'm going to make this horrible choice and die instantly. No. And honestly, in the last 2,000 years, I've never heard of another story like this. I haven't heard of anyone that's been like, oh, I'm just going to like fib to the spirit, and then they dropped it. But you know what? I can guarantee you that every single one of you in this room is going to die. All of you will die. And I will die. From, I know, I actually had a teacher once tell me, and I was like, wow, downer. It was like literally from the moment you're born, you're dying. It's like, oh, that sounds super. Um, but the wages of sin are death. Just like half of our small group leader staff works at Chick-fil-A, and they were all talking about their, um, their minimum wage just went up, and so they're like ballers. So like when they go to work, the wage for them working is they get a paycheck. Well, when we are born onto this planet and we're sinners, the wages of our sin is that we get to die. That sucks. But that's what the Bible tells us, and it's not wrong. This world is decaying. That's why there's death, is because sin was brought into it by the things that we say, by the choices that we make. But Romans tells us that anyone that calls on the name of Jesus, anyone that has that personal relationship with him, he has paid that wage. He paid it when he died on the cross. But the best part is that he beat it and he came back to life so that we can too in eternity. That's
that's why a personal relationship is so important. So he can pay that wage for us. So that we can have a relationship with him that we act out of. We can choose life. Abundant life. Shoot, I still haven't fixed that slide. Meh. We can have abundant life if you want to. But that's why it's so important to know who Jesus is. That's why staff shows up on the weekends and on Tuesdays. That's why we call you when you're missing. That's why we invite you to events. Because you, we want you to have life. We want you to know who Jesus is outside of just hand motions and worship songs on the weekends. Jesus is what makes any of this matter. So as you go today, I want to challenge you with two things. First, I want you to ask yourself, why are you here? Know why you are here. Are you here just for the friends? Are you here just to be like, oh, everyone's raising their hand. I'll raise my hand too. Are you here because there's something drawing you here? There's something about the peace of some of these people that you talk to that you're like, I want what they have. How do I get it? And then make it personal. And by personal, I mean a personal relationship with Christ. If you don't have one already, if you're not responding and acting out of that, talk to a staff member. Stop, talk to a small group leader. Make it personal. There is no point if you don't know Jesus. And golly, he saved us all. I don't want you to miss out on that. Pray with me. Jesus, you are awesome. God, thank you that you, um, that you are here, that we are here. Thank you, God, that you chose to give us this place and this time to come before you. Thank you that your spirit is alive. Thank you that your word is divine. And God, we just give over the rest of the day to you. Thank you for the sunshine. It's awesome, even though I hate it. In your name we pray, amen.